Okay, thank you for your patience. I should be able to share my screen now, which I need to do. There we go. So it looks like we're sharing and we do have a recording going, so that's good. Or no, stop sharing at least. Um, our subject today is ministers, elders, deacons, and ordination, order in God's church. And order is really essential in 1 Corinthians 14.33. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So God doesn't want his church to be in disorder. And this is one of the reasons that he has instituted a, a type of order that involves using people in certain capabilities and positions, such as ministers, elders, and deacons, and using a process called ordination to recognize that among his people. It is important, friends, how we worship God. We cannot come to God in confusion. He doesn't like that. He doesn't accept it. In the book of John, when Jesus was speaking with the Samaritan woman, as recorded in John chapter 4 and verse 24, he says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's important that we do that. Sometimes we, we, may, we may be doing things in our worship, in our church order and system that we have done that we do right now because we've done it that way for years without really having a basis or understanding from it. There was a woman in America and she was preparing to cook a turkey. A turkey is a big American bird. You probably have seen them. And her recipe re required her to cut the turkey in half and to do certain preparations. And the husband one time said, well, why do you cut the bird in half? Why do you do that? She said, I don't know. It's just the way that mother always did it and it worked. So they decided to call mother and they called mother and they asked her why she cut the bird in half. And she replied, well, that's the way my mother always did it. Well, grandmother was still alive. So they, they called grandmother, grandmother, why did you always cut the bird in half? She says, because my oven was too small to put the whole bird in at one time. Well, ovens got bigger. Birds stayed the same size, but they kept getting cut in half, even though they had a bigger oven, just simply because that was the way it was always done. They didn't really even know why they did what they did. We should know why we're doing what we're doing. So we're going to start beginning by talking about elders tonight. And the, the word elder in the New Testament is translated from a Greek word, presbuteros, presbuteros, and this word fundamentally means a person of responsibility and authority in matters of social religious concerns, both in Jewish and in Christian societies. In other words, if you had used this word both in a Jewish or a Christian society, you would have had the same concept. In some languages, though, it's best rendered as older leaders, but in other languages, the more appropriate term would be the equivalent of counselor, since it would be assumed that counselors would be older than the average person in a group, as well as having authority to lead direct, uh, lead in direct activities. That's from the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, based on Somatic Domains, Volume 1, pages 542 and 543. Now, considering this word, prebusteros, uh, pre it's used 67 times in the New Testament, and it's translated elders 65 times. It's translated eldest once in John 8 and 9, and in Acts 2, 7, it's translated as old men. So it clearly carries the concept of someone who's older, someone who has more experience. It's always applied to men. Here are some examples. In Matthew chapter uh, 15 and verse 2, it says, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Another example in Matthew 26 and 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Here we see this concept of elders in the Jewish society as well. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 30. 
it says, which also they, referring to the disciples, did and sent it that was relief to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so there were disciples and they were sending relief for the brethren who were, were poor and, and in need to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul were taking funds to these different elders to help them. In Acts chapter 14, and by the way, if uh, Brother Sammy or anyone out there, if I'm going too fast, slow me down, slow me down. I realize that it may be too fast for people to turn their Bibles and, and we're depending upon the screen, but don't trust me. L read this for yourself. Look it up for yourself. Uh, trust no man. Trust only the Lord. But um, if, if we are used of God, then you can trust what we've teached if it's of God. And, and you can be faithful Bereans, just like those people in Berea who are more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they receive the word with all readiness of mind. And the Bible says that they search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. And the things that they were checking out were the things that the apostle Paul was teaching. And certainly Paul was a man of truth who taught truth, but, and, and Paul, he thought it was good. And Dr. Luke who wrote Acts thought it was good that they were checking Paul out. So if you want to check out everything I say carefully, thoroughly, I will not be in any way insulted or, or feel like that I've been slighted because you didn't trust me. I would prefer that you check out everything that we say here, everything we say. Acts 14.23. And one day, that is Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, had ordained them elders in every city, I'm sorry, in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so here we see an example of Barnabas and Paul ordaining elders in cities that they were visiting. One of those cities was Ephesus, and in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, uh, Paul had uh, stopped at the island of Miletus, and from Miletus he sent to uh, Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So however big this church at Ephesus was, and we'll see that Paul actually spent a good bit of time in Ephesus um, a little bit later, but however big it was, he, um, or maybe that was yesterday, I'm sorry, that was yesterday, we, we noted yesterday that Paul spent 18 months, um, maybe that was at Corinth, I'm sorry, but anyhow, um, it was big enough to have multiple elders, that's the point I wanted to make, going on. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. Here it says, the elders which are among you and I, I, I'm sorry, the elders which are among you, I exhort. The one writing I is the apostle Peter, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here we have Peter, who clearly is an apostle of Christ, but he refers to himself also as an elder. He fit that mold of an older counselor, an older leader, especially at this time. John writing well into his age, one of the last books of the Bible written. It says, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. So here John refers to himself as an elder. Now there's an, another term used in the scripture, uh, at least it's translated in the English King James Bible called bishop. And bishop comes from a Greek word, uh, episkopos, episkopos. And this term episkopos is from two other Greek words um, one is epi and the other uh, skopos, and they together mean an overseer, one who is looking over, one watching over others. And we see an example of this. In fact, this word is used, I believe, I have it here, uh, about four different times in the New Testament. And in one place, it's Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. And there it says, Paul and Timotheus, so that's Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are Philippi, with the bishops, that's the episcopos, and deacons. Now, there's some other words introduced in this verse that we'll come to a little bit later. But here he speaks about that um, they have, this is with the bishops and deacons. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, of good behavior, given the hospitality, apt to teach. So he speaks about the office of a bishop. It's a good office. It's one to be desired. And then he gives a little bit of the qualifications for it. Um, and then we have, and I'm not sure why this verse got in here. So this verse wasn't supposed to be in here, I guess. And let me look at this again. Let's take that verse out and go on. Sorry about that. Now, so we have this term bishop and we have this term elders, but we're going to put together some verses to show that elders are the same as bishops. Two words describing the same church office. In Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, notice it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and you're going to do something. What? And ordain elders. Now, the word elders here comes from the Greek word presbyteros. In every city, as I have appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not ac accused of right or unruly, for, the Greek word here that we translate for is gar, it means for or because it, 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 it shows a cause and effect relationship, okay? This word transfers a cause and effect relationship. For a bishop, episcopos, must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. So he's saying, I want you to set in order and ordain elders and they must be blameless and so on because a, you would think he would say elder, but he says a bishop, but he's using these terms as synonyms. And the, the connecting word uh, for here, translated from Gar, is that is that conjunction that, that brings this cause and effect into clear picture. Uh, we also see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we read a couple of these verses earlier, but let's continue a little bit more in this. Again, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, of good behavior, given the hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. He's telling us some of the characteristics we should be looking for in an elder. Continuing in verses 4 through 7, he says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So we see here, based upon these qualifications that Paul is writing to Timothy, when you're looking to ordain an individual as an elder, there's a very high standard a very high standard that has to be considered. More on this here. In, again, in Timothy, again, and, and we read some of this earlier. We're going to read a little bit more, more with it now. He says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And again, ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee, 
If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, and then continuing in verses 7 through 9, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Verse 8, we add more, but a lover of hospitality. And interestingly, the Greek word we translate hospitality literally means a lover of the stranger, a lover of the stranger. So he should be a lover of hospitality. He's a lover of the stranger, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. So those are some of the characteristics of the, uh, of the elder. Now, I'd just like to share just a, a few uh, points here, and I've got a little uh, list here of some important characteristics based upon these things that we've read about elders. The first thing is that character does matter. The elder is an individual who should be above reproach. He's to be blameless. Now, I understand. He's not perfect yet. We're striving for perfection. You know, if, if we try to, to make the person too perfect too quick, we may be going ahead of the work of God. But certainly, he should be uh, of high standing. He should not be living a willfully sinful lifestyle. It's important to understand that the character of a person is not determined just by what is seen in public, but by what also happens in his own house. If you want to lead, friends, or you want someone to lead in church, focus first on becoming a good leader in your home first. So character matters. The second point, self-control. Says he must be tempered, he must be self-controlled. This person should be able to control their anger, their appetites, and their attitudes and passions. This person should be living out the fruit of the spirit, which includes self-control or temperance. People, for example, who are hotheads or who have uncontrolled passions, they do not, and they cannot be good leaders in the church. Now, I'm not saying, friends, that, um, that, that God doesn't love or want to use people like that, but he has high qualifications to be a leader in his church because they have an impact and influence on many others, so their behavior really matters. They are to be people of maturity. Maturity here matters. It's so important that a person never gets rushed into a leadership position. And I think it's very true that if you want to set someone up for failure, let them be a leader when they're not ready. As great as leadership can be, there are many dangers and pitfalls as well. Paul mentions pride as one of them. And the challenge of being an elder is that not only will people look up to you, they may tell you what they think of you, both good and bad. And friends, if you're not mature enough to handle this, it can increase your confidence in a wrong way, causing you to think that you're really more important than you really are. And on the other hand, it can destroy your confidence, causing you to think that you can't do anything right. And so it takes a, a good degree of maturity to be an elder, and the church can't discount this when choosing leaders. Another important point about elders, they should be people of sound doctrine and have the ability to teach. As an elder, one of the responsibilities is to help others to grow. And if you want to do this, or if you want to see a person in your church fulfill this role, then you or they must be able to teach others, and they must also hold sound doctrine. Remember, people look to elders for guidance and instruction, and you need to know what you believe, and you need to be able to articulate it or express it to others. Also, the elder must be a person who genuinely cares for others. One of the most important qualifications of an elder is that they must be able to have a deep, honest, heartfelt caring for the people. They must be people of hospitality. They must be the kind of people that welcome other people. 
you can't be an elder of friends if you don't like to be around other people or involved with people. It just won't work. The most important function as an elder is caring for the people of God. And if someone doesn't like people or doesn't like being around people, then they're probably just not a good fit to be an elder. And this is one of the reasons that um, when we consider these things that Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, that's 1 Timothy 5, 22, he said, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. Now, as I said, sometimes we do things because simply we've done it over and over, just like the woman who cut the turkey in half. And let me get just a drink of water. Thank you. It has been the practice, the custom of the Adventist church, as an example, and many other churches too, to choose elders as well as deacons and other people responsibly on a yearly basis. We might say in the year 2021, we want Brother Smith and Brother Wilberforce and Brother Stump to be the elders of the church. But friends, that's not a biblical concept. There's no place in the Bible where it says that the elders were to be elected for a year or for any period of time. If a man came to the place that he was chosen, dedicated as an elder, he remained an elder all of his life, and his eldership was recognized throughout the churches of God. Now, let's talk a little bit about deacons. A deacon is from the Greek word uh, diakon, diakon, sorry, get this down. Diko, dikonos, dikonos, dikonos. And it means a minister or a servant. Now, that's an interesting idea, especially when we look at some other verses. We noted Philippians 1 1 earlier, where Paul was greeting the saints in Christ uh, with the bishops, but also he says with the deacons, with these men who are deacons. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, or I'm sorry, 8 through 13, there. He says, likewise, must the deacons be grave? Now, he's been giving the characteristics of an elder or a bishop. Now, he's going to give some of the characteristics of the deacons. He says, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Here he mentions deacons four times. Now, this word that we translate deacon in the New Testament is used four times in the book of Esther in the Old Testament. It's a word that means servant. And in three of those places, it in fact is translated servant. Now, the Septuagint, again, if you're not familiar with it, it is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was the Bible of the apostles. It was the Bible that was in common use in the time of Christ. They really weren't reading the Hebrew Bible then. They were using a Greek translation of it. And in Esther 2.2, Esther 6.3, Esther 6.5, you will find this Greek word there that we translate deacon in the New Testament. And interestingly, in Esther chapter 1 and verse 10 is translated chamberlains, and that is at least in the King James Version of the Bible. Now, there is a feminine form of this word, and it is used in Romans 16.1 in reference to a sister whose name was Phoebe. He says, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church. And so 
Phoebe, she was a servant. But remember, this word deacon literally means servant, and it's translated servant seven times in the New Testament. For instance, in Matthew 23 and verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. But that could have been translated deacon because it's from the same word as deacon. So the word deacon simply means a servant, a servant. Also, Mark 9, 35. And as he sat down and called the 12 and saith unto them, if any man desire to be the first or to be first, the same shall be last of all and of all. And uh, in Romans 16, 1, I guess, again, we saw that there's a, another feminine form of it. Now, let me just show you a graphic translation ring here. This here, here we have this word, deaconos, and it's translated deacon, we see here, um, but it's also translated servant. And yet, 20 out of 30 times it's used, it's translated as minister. It's translated as minister. And so now we've got, we got elders who are bishops and we have deacons who are ministers and elders working as ministers. Sounds like it all intertwines a lot. And it does. But there are yet distinctions. And we're going to be looking at some of these. But in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26 is an example. But it shall not be among you. Uh, um, so among you talking about striving for supremacy among each other but whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister or let him be your servant ministers are servants so that's the thing to keep in mind here in romans 13 and verse 4 it says for he it's speaking about the governmental ruler is the minister of god he is the servant of god he is the deacon of god to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, he says, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister, again, the same word we translate, deacon of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So these are some of the ways that we see this is used. Another one is uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is apostle but ministers? They are servants by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now, we generally sometimes today think of a minister as like the pastor or the preacher, an evangelist. But anyone who is a servant was someone who is ministering, i.e. being a minister, in a sense, to others. Now, what about, you may be thinking right now, what about the seven deacons of Acts, the, the, the seven deacons of Acts chapter 6. So let's read about those. Um, here's also 2 Corinthians 3, 6, where we have the term ministers used. But let's go to Acts chapter 6. And here we have, and I, I won't take time to read this, but I think we're familiar with the, the story that there was this dispute going on between some of the widows and the apostles said, look, we don't have time to deal with this. And we are going to appoint uh, seven men to deal with this. And they're mentioned here by name. Stephen was one. Philip was another. Uh, Procreus and so on. And uh, they, they set them before the apostles and they laid their hands on them. Now, it's interesting. It's, as you look through this, um, and we're going back in verse Three. I do want to make a point here in verse 3. He says, Wherefore, brethren, now this is Peter and the apostles speaking to the brethren. He says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So the disciples, the apostles rather than themselves, they didn't choose these people. They allowed the congregation to choose them. They believed the congregation had enough understanding, enough wisdom, and enough of the Holy Ghost to be able to make this decision. And then they, after they were just chosen by the congregation, they were then appointed or ordained, had hands laid upon them by the apostles. Now, interestingly, in this account here, they are never called deacons in, in the text itself. But 
there is a, a, uh, a section I'd like to read to you, uh, not too long, from the book Acts of the Apostles by Ellen White, referring and talking about this uh, incident. And uh, it begins by quoting, it says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And this is in Acts of the Apostles, beginning on page 89. I'll be reading paragraphs 1, 2, and 3, I believe here. And reading and beginning paragraph 1. It says, This advice was followed, and by prayer and the laying on of hands, seven chosen men were solemnly set apart for their duties as deacons. And so she helps to fill in here and says that they were deacons. Now notice what she also says, paragraph 2. The appointment of the seven to take the oversight of special lines of work proved a great blessing to the church. These officers gave careful consideration to individual needs as well as to the general financial interests of the church. And by their prudent management and their godly example, they were an important aid to their fellow officers in binding together the various interests of the church into a united whole. And then in paragraph three, and I've got it in two different slides because it's a longer paragraph. It says that this step was in the order of God is revealed in the immediate results for good that were seen. The word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This ingathering of souls was due both to the greater freedom secured by the apostles and to the zeal and power shown by the seven deacons. Isn't that a blessing, friends? That as they went about and did a certain work to relieve the ministers so that they could be about their work even better, they could do more work, but also these men, they worked also for the saving of souls in a direct way. And we're going to see that now. Going on, it says, the fact that these brethren had been ordained for the special work of looking after the needs of the poor did not exclude them from teaching the faith. On the contrary, they were, now notice this, they were fully qualified to instruct others in, in the truth, and they engaged in the work with great earnestness and success. Now, Acts chapter 8 tells about Philip having a great revival in Samaria. This cannot be referring to Philip the Apostle because in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it's just, it, it specifically states that the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And so this reference must be to Philip the deacon by the one who's named as such in chapter 6 and verse 5. But because he was conspicuous in his early evangelism, he was afterwards known as Philip the Evangelist. And you can read that in Acts chapter 21 verse 8 as an example. But I want you to notice now some of the story from Acts chapter 8. And then I'm going to ask a question here in just a minute. Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, um, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done, now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So Philip has went to Samaria. He has this great revival going on. People listen. People accept the message. They're getting baptized. Word gets back to headquarters in Jerusalem. They say, we better go check this guy out. Let's see if we can help him. They send Peter and John there. So remember, during this time, the apostles, other apostles, they'd all stayed in Jerusalem. Now, my question is this. Who baptized these people? Who baptized them? Who baptized them? It wasn't Peter or John. They weren't there yet. None of the other apostles had come down yet. We don't have any record of any elders being there yet. No record of ministers being there. Who baptized them? Let's go on. There's a story now continuing. Even though he's got this great revival going on, Holy Ghost speaks to Philip. He says, go down toward the desert road. And uh, that's what it says here. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, arise, and go toward the south and to the way that goeth down from Jerusalem in the Gaza, which is desert. Uh, desert actually is in an adjective form here. It modifies something and 
some translators believe it should be desert road, which is a desert road. No, it's go down this way. And so he did that. And uh, he met there, we know, the Ethiopian eunuch. And it says he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went down the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he, that is Philip, baptized this eunuch. So who was baptizing those people in Samaria? It must have been Philip. But, you know, why do we do what we do? Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we not do certain things that we don't do? Sometimes it's because of simple tradition that may not be grounded in the Word of God. You know, if, if you are in certain churches, such as the Adventist Church, you know, only the ordained minister, or in extreme cases, can a elder baptize someone. But here we see, from an Ecclesiastes standpoint, we see the deacon baptizing someone. Now, there are two fundamental ordinances in the Christian church. There's baptism, and then there's communion, the Lord's Supper. And in, in the scriptures, there, there, other than the Lord's Supper that we read about in the Gospels, there's no specific uh, story about the Lord's Supper or delineation on how it has to be done other than what's in the Gospels. You know, the, the, the Bible has certain references of, of the apostles breaking bread daily together, but it doesn't doesn't say necessarily it was a communion service. Might have been. But if it was, we're not told how it happened. We're not given the details. But I was looking up some things in the spirit of prophecy, and I came across this in the indexes. If you're familiar, there's a three-volume index series, and the three-volume index series is also in the computer app, app um, computer and smartphone app, tablet app. And it says that ordained ministers are authorized to administer and speaking about the communion service. Ordained ministers are authorized to this, but what is an ordained minister? Well, you know, I went to early writings, page 101, and wanted to see what it was actually saying. And so I've got this here. It's, it's actually uh, starts on page 100 and goes to 101, but so it's listed as 100.2 as the actual reference now. But I want to read to you these. Uh, there's three slides here that cover this one paragraph. Ellen White says, I saw that this door at which the enemy comes in to perplex and trouble the flock can be shut. I inquired of the angel how it could be closed. He said, the church must flee to God's word and become established upon what? Gospel order. Gospel order. And on Thursday, we're going to be looking at two different extremes. The extreme of no gospel order and the extreme of hierarchism and how gospel order comes in between. But it says gospel order, which has been overlooked and neglect, this is indispensably necessary in order to bring the church into the unity of the faith. That's an interesting st statement because sometimes we think about, you know, well, before we can have order, we have to have all everybody in the faith. But it says that having the gospel order will help bring everybody into the faith. I saw that in the Apostles' Day, the church was in danger of being deceived and imposed upon by false teachers. So something has to be done to keep false teachers away. Therefore, the brethren chose men. You see, the, the brethren at large, they chose men who had given good evidence that they were capable of ruling well their own house and pre preserving order in their own families and who could enlighten those who were in darkness Inquiry was made of God concerning these, and then, according to the mind of the church and the Holy Ghost, they were set apart by the laying on of hands. She continues, having received their commission from God and having the approbation of the church, they went forth baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and administering the ordinances of the Lord's house, often waiting upon the saints by presenting them the emblems of the broken body and spilt blood of the crucified Savior to keep fresh in the memory of God's beloved children, his sufferings and death. Do you know what's missing here? What's missing here is statements saying that these were ordained ministers. She never says that they're ordained ministers. She just speaks about the necessity for gospel order, that there had to be something to keep imposters out of the church, and so the brethren chose men. And she doesn't say in what capacity these men were serving.
but apparently some of those men were serving as elders and some were serving as deacons. Now, we talked about ministers. Interestingly, again, in the New Testament, the word minister usually is translated from the same word that we translate as deacon. For instance, in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And that again is the same word for deacon. And in Colossians chapter four and verse seven, we have the same thing. He says, all, all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord. Now, there are a couple other words that are translated as minister and, and mean to serve or to help. But by and large, most of the times that we read about a minister or someone ministering, it is from the same Greek word that we translate deacon or a form of it. Now, we have here now a situation where there are elders and deacons and they're all servants. They're all ministering to a degree. But it is true that the elder was someone who was older, who seemed to have more authority because it was the apostles who were also elders that, that decreed that the deacons or that specific area of leadership in the church should exist. Now let's talk a little bit about ordination. When Christ ordained the apostles, there was later not a separate ordination for ministers except as for the elders. In other words, we read about men who were ordained as elders, men who had hands laid upon them as elders in the church, and we've seen some of those examples already, but we never read about a separate ordination for the, quote, minister who maybe is serving as a pastor or uh, an evangelist. Deacons were a separate area, and they were ordained also. Here we see, for instance, in uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it says, and he ordained, and that Greek word is, is, is po'o, he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Uh, po'o is a word that means to make or to do. He just set them up. That was Jesus with the original 12. In John chapter 15, verse 16, he says, ye have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. Now here we have a different word for ordained, and this is tethimi, tethimi. And uh, this means, it says, to place, to, to, to assign, to set in, in, in a place. And so uh, Jesus says, I have ordained you, I have set you so. And of course, we did this so that we could have fruit. Another place is Acts 14.23. It says, and when they had ordained, and here we have another word for ordained, them elders in every city, and prayed and fasted, they commended them to the Lord whom they believed. And this word simply means to vote by stretching out the hand or to a point. So when they had ordained elders, when they had voted and, and ordained elders, then they laid hands on them. They fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them. So the, the church had made uh, a choice. And then we have another one, Titus 1.5. Here we have uh, another Greek word, kathistomy, kathistomy. And it says, for this cause, let I thee increase, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. And this word again means to set in order, to appoint, uh, to make, to put in charge, etc. Now, special things can happen because of ordination. You see, friends, when we follow God's order he recognizes that we are following his order and he shows his approval in first timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 the apostle paul says to timothy neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by a prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery and this is from the same Greek word that it sounds like. Now notice he says, neglect not to get that which is in thee, and you got this gift through the prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the elders. And so when someone comes in to be ordained, 
God gives them special gifts and benefits, and he recognizes his work in this way. Again, like yesterday's topic on evangelism, there is a lot in the Bible on this. Sometimes the challenge is to try to condense it and to simplify it, to lay it out in, in a definitive way so that you can now take it and you can take these biblical principles, these biblical facts, and you can apply them into your um, gospel order that is so essential in Kenya, there in Nairobi, and in other places, and in every place that this message reaches out to, because it's the same message, the same scriptures, whether we are in, in uh, Moldova, like Sister Ira, uh, Sister Irena, we call her Ira, that is, uh, joined us, or whether we're in, in America or Africa, or wherever. And again, these, these, these individuals who serve, they are to be of the highest quality individuals, and God will use them if they will remain humble to do a great work. And I'll leave it up to you all for questions. Now, uh, Brother Wilberforce has a copy, a PDF of these slides. If you'd like to have them, I'm sure he can make arrangements for you to get them. Uh, and so I'll turn it back over to him for questions at this time, if he has questions, anyone has questions. Will you pray first before we enter into a question and answer period? I sure will. Yes, absolutely. Father in heaven, I want to thank you. I know that um, because of the physical infirmities I have right now, that uh, I have not articulated as well as I've wanted to, and I've tried to slow down and think more clearly, and I appreciate that you've helped me. But where I have failed to make things clear, I ask that your Holy Spirit will take your word and clarify it and amplify it and explain it into the minds of the people to their edification and, and the blessing of your church. And as we go into this uh, time of questions and answers, help us to uh, have understanding and wisdom. And may your spirit direct, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.